So, Martin, do you want to share the, the meeting now? To... Yes, I can do so, yeah. Sorry. Okay, very good. So, so I'll let, let you go. Come to the, to the second part of, of today's session for, for Americans, the morning session for the <laughs> Europeans, the afternoon session. Um, um, the next talk is by Bajiril, in it is on uh, small x, in small x improved uh, TMD factorization. So, whenever you're ready, Cyril, please. Uh, yes, let me share the screen. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk about several results that uh, well, they are the result of research which started actually a decade ago when we set out to understand the connection between the KT dependent gluon distributions that appear in small x approaches such as BFKL, color glass condensate, and the KT dependent gluon distribution, which appear in the large Q square approaches that uh, are called TMDs or transverse momentum dependent distribution. And as you will see, this led to uh, several interesting results and this novel factorization framework that we call uh, ITMD for improved TMD factorization. So there will be three main parts. The first one will be uh, give the definition of gluon TMDs in the small x limit, uh, especially discuss the process dependence of these objects, which is something that is new when you start considering non-zero transverse momentum or rather non-integrated transverse momentum and uh, give you some results that we have obtained in the small x limit. In particular, we can calculate their QCD evolution from the uh, well-known Jim work equation. And then the second part will be about how these objects, they enter in uh, hard processes and how they can be tested at colliders. And this is where the improved TMD factorization framework uh, comes into the game. And uh, I will try to explain to you uh, in what sense it is a unification of BFKL physics and TMD physics which can be uh, all incorporated into a single uh, framework. And finally, the last part will be uh, about uh, gluon polarization, transverse gluon polarization, and uh, trying to motivate how to, one could use this transverse gluon polarization to look for saturation effects at colliders. So I'm starting with uh, naive operator definition of a gluon TMD distribution with two field strength tensors, one at position zero, the other at position xi with a plus component and a transverse component. And these variables are Fourier transformed into the x and kt uh, dependence, sorry. But in fact, the, this definition is not sufficient uh, it's not gauge invariant, and this is because there are important contributions missing into that definition. That definition corresponds to uh, any of those diagrams that I drew below without the blue gluon. But you need to incorporate uh, these corrections that are uh, pictured here. Uh, these blue gluons are called Glauber gluons in the TMD community. And uh, these diagrams contribute to leading power to the definition of the TMD and need to be included. However, uh, the nature of the hard blob here, which is called H, will uh, impact uh, the resulting operator definition that you get when you include those um, blue ones. But in any case, uh, the resummation works in such a way that what you obtain is simply the same as before, but with now a gauge link uh, that will connect the field strength tensor at position zero and the field strength tensor at position xi. And this gauge link is a path order exponential of the gauge field. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, while you know the starting point and the finishing point of the gauge link, the path that it follows is not uh, fixed a priori, and it will it is actually fixed by the kind of process that you consider. Okay, so depending on what you have in this uh, blob H, you will get a uh, different uh, different path for the gauge link, and 
in a given process, several operator definition can be involved. And it's also uh, works the same uh, if you go to NLO, that you have to go to NLO, you have a much more complicated H blob. And so you get uh, much more uh, possible operator definition that enter into, into your, your cross section. To be a bit concrete, here are some examples of the path that can follow. You start from zero, you stay uh, at psi plus equals zero, but you go to plus infinity. Sorry, you stay at psi t equals zero, you go to plus infinity, then you move into the transverse plane, then you come back to position psi. You can go the other way to minus infinity. You can also have loops and uh, other more complicated things. But uh, the uh, interesting property is that when you consider large transverse momentum, when you consider large transverse momentum, you can neglect the psi t separation between the two field strength tensor. And as a result, uh, the gauge length dependence, the process dependence disappears. And in particular, when you work at small x, you see that all the possible gluon operator definition for the TMDs they all coincide uh, to a single function, which happens to be what is known as the unintegrated Boolean distribution in the BFKL uh, frameworks. And in fact, you, to take the large KT limit, so the TMDs are equal to the UGD and the corrections to this uh, first show up as corrections that go as QS squared divided by uh, KT squared. And so these are in fact, due to nonlinear effects. See, there are saturation corrections that uh, at small x differentiate between the various uh, TMT definitions. Uh, one, this is a qualitative statement, but we can uh, make it more quantitative. We can uh, actually try to calculate them using uh, the CGC effective theory. We basically replace the uh, matrix uh, element uh, the hadronic matrix elements by uh, a classical field uh, integration over a probability distribution for the classical fields. Uh, let's be a bit more concrete. These are two uh, famous uh, Boolean TMDs. The first one is called the dipole Boolean TMD. The second one is called the Weissacker Williams Boolean TMD. So the difference between the two is that in the first case, you're going to first to minus from zero, you're going to close the first link to minus infinity and you're closing the second link to plus infinity. But in the second case, you are closing both links at plus infinity. And that seems like a very small difference, but it has a actually very important difference. Um, so when you, you, know, you take, you calculate this at small x, you end up uh, with uh, now, Wilson lines that go all from minus infinity to plus infinity. I don't have time to show you how this happens, but uh, it is done in the paper. Now the only objects you have, uh, you've replaced all your links and all your field strength tensor by derivatives of these uh, Wilson lines, straight Wilson lines at some given transverse position. And uh, so for the dipole gluon TMD, you only have two of them with two derivatives which can actually be integrated by part easily and you just get kt squared times uh, for your transform of a dipole distribution. This is why it's called the dipole gluon TMD. And the other one is a bit more complicated. It involves uh, two derivative of Wilson lines and two Wilson lines, but only two transverse positions, x and y. Now these correlators, they can be uh, evaluated numerically using the Jim Walk Hamiltonian uh, includes BFKL physics and saturation physics. So schematically, this is what a solution looks like. Uh, it has a, a perturbative tail and one over k square. Uh, so here, because I, I plotted the gluon distribution multiplied by k, then the tail becomes one over k. And then uh, on this, it goes to zero at small k because it's multiplied by k, but not all of the TMDs are uh, not all of the TMDs go to zero when you don't multiply by K as you will see on the next curve. 
And this is a function of K, the transverse momentum. And as most of you know, when you start decreasing X going to smaller and smaller values of X, essentially the only thing that happens is that this uh, curve gets translated to the right. And you have the gluon saturation scale QS, which uh, we define here as the maximum of this curve, the, more, the transverse momentum for which this curve is maximum. That, that will be also the typical average transverse momentum of the gluons. So going a bit more quantitative, uh, this is an example of five possible gluon TMDs that were calculated uh, solving this uh, Chimok equation on the lattice using a, a code that was written by uh, my colleague Claude Ronel. And uh, you see that at large transverse momentum, you recover a single universal perturbative tail, as was expected. And when the transverse momentum starts to approach the saturation scale at low PT. This is when saturation effects start to play a role. And uh, the effect is that they impact the various gluon distributions uh, in very different ways. Some of them go to zero, some of them uh, become constant, some of them keep growing logarithmically. All right, uh, so I, I should say this was uh, something we did some years ago, uh, but using the leading log GMWOC evolution equation. But uh, this is not enough if we would want to use those uh, to do phenomenological studies. Instead, we should try to calculate them using GMWOC equations supplemented by running coupling at the very least to get uh, at least an evolution speed that is closer to uh, phenomenology. And uh, this gets a bit complicated because to include the running coupling in the gym work equation, there are different prescriptions. And uh, we made a recent study recently to try to study what are the differences between the various prescriptions. You have the so-called noise prescription, so-called square root prescription. We also studied a new uh, rather recent prescription uh, proposed by Hata and Yonku which is not uh, plotted on this uh, figure. And uh, depending on which prescription you use, uh, the various ways that you can implement the GMWOC equation on the lattice will give you slightly different results. And uh, so this needs to be understood uh, before uh, going further and calculated uh, all of these gluon TMDs uh, for phenomenology. Uh, the, the gluon TMD that is plotted here is the simplest one here in, is the dipole TMD. But, okay, regardless, if we can't use Jumok equation yet, we can use uh, some approximation of it, which boils down to using the balitsky kopchegov equation with running coupling. And uh, with this, we can calculate uh, these objects here for uh, any given path. So that was the end of the, the first part. Maybe uh, it's a good time if you have some questions, uh, you can uh, interrupt me now, if I don't mind, before I go into the second part of the talk. All right, let's continue. So now, uh, how to probe these, uh, these uh, distributions, gluon distributions in, in, a, in a collider experiments. So the uh, prototypical uh, process to do this is to look at dilute dense collisions, so-called dilute dense collisions, where you have uh, so a projectile which contributes to the collision with large X partons and a target which contributes to the collision with uh, small X. Partons. So you can use the well-known uh, parton structure of the large X guy to probe the small X uh, parton structure of the dense guy. And how you do this, you to enforce this kinematically by looking at production of particles in the forward reach. Okay. But in order to also uh, be sensitive to gluon TMDs, we need a process that has two scales, a hard scale, and a semi-hard scale. And so to do this, we use dijets or dihadrons. 
Okay, so we have uh, PT1, Y1, PT2, Y2. So we have the kinematics of X1, as I said, very large due to the forward rapidities, X2 very small. And uh, another consequence of this ordering of this uh, asymmetry is the fact that the typical transverse momentum of the partons in the dilute projectile will be of order of lambda QCD. While the typical transverse momentum of the partons in the target will be of order QS of the target. The smaller is X2, the bigger is QS. The bigger is this mismatch between KT2 average and KT1 average. And so that allows you, gives you at least a, a parameter which you can take small in theory and you can neglect transverse momentum in one side, but not neglect it on the other side. All right, so in, as a result of the gluon transverse momentum that I denote K here, as a transverse component that is equal to vector PT1 plus vector PT2 from simply uh, momentum uh, conservation. And the KT of the gluon is what will provide us with the uh, soft scale or the semi-hard scale. So scale that can be very small, can be zero if the two jets are back to back with equal magnitude. It can get large, as large as the PT of a single jet if you look at uh, production at 90 degrees, for instance. PT1 and PT2, which I will generically call capital P, uh, they will play the role of the hard scales. So these are uh, jet momenta. You can have 20, 40, 50 GeV. You don't want to go too high because then you run out of phase space to go to small x. But they're, they're much, much larger than QS. Okay, QS is a couple of GeV. And then the KT is typically in between the two can be as small as QS, sometimes, can be, sometimes it can also be as large as P. And so this is the, the, the process in which we establish this, uh, this, fact, this improved TMD factorization. So how does it work? It, it looks like any factorization formula, you have a matrix element part and a gluon, a part on distribution part. But the, the, interest, the important thing is that you have uh, several of those products of hard factor times Leon TMD. Because as I said, the gauge link in the operator definition of the Leon TMDs is not unique. And so you need to take into account this fact. And so for a you know, generic process, you have a sum over C. C is meant to, uh, to, to be a sum over channels. But and in each of those channels, you have uh, a hard factor and a TMD. Now the TMD only depends on the small scale KT and obviously on X2 and also on QS, but it doesn't depend on the capital P. This is where the factorization is. The hard factor on the other hand, doesn't depend on the X2, it doesn't depend on QS, that's only in the TMD part, but it depends on the two kinematical variable P and K. Now, let me be a bit more uh, detailed. I can open up these guys. As, as I already explained before, the TMDs at large transverse momentum KT, they have a universal perturbative tail that is the UGD. And what will differentiate the various TMDs are the saturation effects, okay, which we called I like to call them leading twist saturation correction because they don't depend, they're not suppressed by any powers of the hard scale. They're suppressed by power of KT square. And on the other side, you have the hard matrix element, which can decompose into the leading twist part of it, which arise when you take KT equals zero. This is, uh, this is the hard factor which goes into TMD factorization. And uh, the KT dependent part of the hard factor, which uh, are called uh, kinematic higher twists. So they're higher power corrections to the process, but uh, they're called kinematic higher twists because they go as KT squared over P squared. And those are included into this factorization formula. So this is 
this is in in what sense is the TMD factorization improved by this formula? It is improved precisely because of this uh, kinematical higher twists, which are absent in the TMD framework, but which we have here, and which allow us to uh, apply the formula not only at very small kt, but also going to large kt, as large as momentum p. That allows to, to match a TMD formula to BFKL physics. On the other hand, you can view this formula as an improvement over uh, BFKL physics. In, in this case, uh, the factorization is called high energy factorization in the case of BFKL physics. Sometimes it's called KT factorization also. And this, so what this factorization doesn't have that ITMD has is that it doesn't know anything about saturation physics. So it doesn't have this correction. As a result, any BF cal calculation will only involve a single and integrated Boolean distribution. But what, does, what it does know is it does know about the full half factors. So in this sense, uh, the improvement with respect to BFKL is that this factorization formula in, includes the uh, leading twist saturation correction and allows to match properly to TMD physics at low KT. Now, uh, I've explained to you how ITMD encompasses both TMD regime and BFKL regime, but it, uh, it's, it lacks what is called uh, genuine twist corrections. And uh, these are corrections that are higher twists, so they're suppressed by power of the R scale PT, but they're not KT over PT uh, corrections as we have before, which are already included. They are the rest, essentially which are of the order of QS over PT for the largest ones. Of course, we also have lambda QCD over PT corrections uh, as well. And uh, yeah, it was shown recently that the difference between the full color glass condensate calculation and the ITMD factorization is precisely those uh, genuine twist corrections. So ITMD will work well when the, the hard scale PT is much bigger than the saturation scale QS. So it's perfectly suited to study uh, forward digests. Now, uh, one can also try to compare them numerically to see the uh, magnitude of uh, the error that we do when we don't use CGC, but use ITMD instead. We, we did this um, last year in the context of PA collisions or digests. And uh, there was a recent paper a couple of weeks ago from the Brookhaven group where they also looked at this uh, uh, in, for digest in DIS. Uh, I show you a couple of results that we obtained. So we look at uh, QQ budget production in PA collisions, uh, 5 TV. The, this is plotting the cross sections as a function of the azimuthal angle between the digests. So the two curves are CGC and ITMD. If PT would be 20 GV, for instance, you wouldn't see any difference between the two curves. So, so I didn't show it because they really coincide everywhere. You start to lower the PT. So you start to, uh, to give a bit more importance to this genuine twist correction. And you start to see deviations between the two formula, start to see the, the genuine twist appear at a large, I mean, at angles away from delta phi equals pi. This is where they first appear. Then if you go down to 5 GV for the PTs, now they start to be, uh, start to matter 10, 10, 20%. But uh, we see that they are under control. I mean, if we really look at 20 GV jets, we don't need to use the full CGC machinery to calculate the cross section. We just use this simple factorization formula, okay. which, is, which is evaluated very easily numerically compared to the CGC calculation. Okay, and now in the, I think 10 minutes that I have left, uh, I want to discuss about uh, gluon polarization. Uh, okay, this is something that uh, all this research uh, made us realize the importance of gluon polarization at small x. But first, uh, some slide about spin physics and TMDs. Uh, so you may be aware of these uh, eight leading twist 
quark TMDs because they have, they have been discussed a lot in the literature. Gluon TMDs are a bit less known, less studied. So um, as you look at polarized collisions and you look at polarization of quark inside of unpolarized nucleons or longitudinally polarized nucleons or transversely polarized nucleons or vice versa, you have access to various TMDs. Two famous ones are the Bohr Mulder's function or the Sievers function. Of course, the helicity is also very famous. This, uh, this concerns longitudinal polarization, but I'm not going to discuss this here. What I'm discussing now are this first column. I look at unpolarized beams, okay, unpolarized collisions, but uh, when you do this, you are not only sensitive to the regular unintegrated gluon distribution, you also are sensitive to the equivalent of the bohr mulders function for gluons. And how you see this, you, you can see this looking at the operator definition again. So what, in what I explained before, I always, uh, for simplicity, kept those two Lorentz indices uh, equal. So I was only explaining things for uh, a projection of this operator onto delta ij, which if you do this, you would just get the unpolarized gluon TMDs. But everything I said before, the gauge link dependence, the fact that the universality at large KT, all of this uh, is still true when you look at this correlator with i different from j. Okay, so when you do this, you, uh, you bring into the game this new gluon distribution that is the, uh, carries information about gluon polarization. So in the ITMD cross-section, for instance, that I uh, had on the previous slide, I simply had a sum over C of channels, but in fact, what this tells me is that the gluon TMDs always come by pair. So I can be a bit more explicit now and expand the sum I had before and write it like this, why I, why I explicitly leave the Lorentz indices on the hard factors I and J and the Lorentz indices in the, two, these are two dimensional Lorentz indices in the definition, in the operator definitions. So gluon polarization H in principle is there. TMDs come by pair, as I said, but uh, there, is a, there is some exceptions. Some type of TMDs, the TMDs which are of the dipole type, uh, in this case, F is always equals to H. So if you have a process in which you're sensitive only to dipole type TMDs, then you won't see any difference in, in this case. But it's not, it's in general, uh, they are different, except again at very large KT. The perturbative tail of F and of H is the same. It is the unintegrated gluon distribution. Okay, it means that uh, in BFKL physics, you cannot make the difference between the two uh, functions, okay? The small exogluons in BFKL are fully linearly polarized. And uh, yes, it is a saturation correction which starts to, uh, to give importance to this function H. So in, I'm writing again this factorization formula but now I'm doing the, I'm contracting, I'm projecting the hard factors into the, those polarization vectors. And I'm writing the formula in this way. Uh, you have the projection of the hard factor onto Ki, Kj over K squared. That is called, uh, for historical reasons, the nonsense polarization projection. So you have this hard factor that multiplies the unpolarized distribution and the projection onto the linear polarization I call it HH. And uh, this is multiplied by H minus F. And so in BFKL calculations, you never see this term because uh, these two functions are equal if you don't know anything about QS and you're at large KT. So that's very interesting because we may use, uh, try to use manifestation of this second term in the factorization formula to identify experimentally uh, the presence of saturation effects. But for this, you also need to consider processes where uh, the hard factor is non-zero. 
And that's also not happen all, uh, automatically. Uh, so there are, we found a few processes for which they are non-zero. Uh, digest in DIS, this hard factor is non-zero. But if you do photo production, the hard factor will vanish. You need that extra Q square scale to make this, this uh, HH non-zero. Heavy quark pair production in PA collisions or, or in photo production will also give you a non-zero H because of the heavy quark mass, you have this additional scale that you need to get a non-zero uh, uh, projection onto this linear polarization. And uh, any other process that has more than two particles will also work because when you have uh, three particles, you've got diagrams where you have virtual intermediate particles and the virtuality of these intermediate particles plays the role of the additional scale that you need in order to get a non-zero projection onto the transverse polarization. All right, so this is, so yes, so we, something we started to study, for instance, um, this is uh, for die jets in deep inelastic scattering. The top plot is for transversely polarized incoming photon. And the bottom plot is for a longitudinally polarized incoming photon. And this is a delta phi distribution of the die jets. And what is shown is the uh, quote unquote BFKL cross section. It means this cross section without the second term because it's zero if I stick to the BFKL framework divided by the full cross section. And we did this to estimate the magnitude of this second term with respect to the uh, full cross section. And you see that this is very process dependent the top curve, the top plot, uh, you see that uh, it's around always around unity. You've got 5% deviations that uh, start to show up around delta phi equals pi. But, okay, this correction due to gluon polarization remains rather small. However, for longitudinal photon is the complete opposite. For longitudinal photon producing two digests, the second term in this equation is actually the dominant term. So if you do a BFKL calculation of uh, digests coming from longitudinally polarized photons, you are getting a wrong answer because there is uh, a huge contribution that comes from this term. And in fact, it's due to the fact that for this process, the nonsense heart factor is much, much smaller than the hard factor projecting onto linear, linearly polarized. Uh, yes, because the unintegrated Gluon distribution F uh, is always much bigger than the difference between F and H. But for that, that particular process, this is completely overcompensated by the, the ratio of these hard factors, which is completely opposite. So that's something that's very interesting. Uh, another place where one could look at this is uh, heavy quark, anti-quark production in PA collision in the forward direction. And this is something that uh, we looked at uh, a few years ago, but uh, uh, very superficially, which was done for uh, a yellow report for high luminosity LHC yellow report. But this is something that we plan to continue to, uh, to do a bit more seriously. That means including the ITMD arc factors, which will be important to get a better description at uh, angles away from pi. And also we need to include a, a soft gluon resummation when we look at the region uh, delta phi equals pi, because there, these uh, soft gluons are also important and change the, the delta phi shape. So there is some, uh, some more work to be done. But we hope to be able to uh, try to identify uh, at colliders a potential signal of this, the second term of this equation. All right, so let me come to my conclusions. Uh, first, uh, main messages from the, of what is improved TMD factorization. So it is a factorization framework which emerges from CGC calculations after you neglect so-called genuine higher twist corrections. So anything that's power suppressed, that's, uh, and that's uh, of order of QS divided by the hard scale, which we don't need in fact to study uh, 
jet cross sections. HTMD factorization, however, will resum both kinds of uh, ratios. Uh, the other ratios that involve those three scales, K, Q, uh, QS over KT and KT over PT. And because it resumes both, it nicely incorporates other small X frameworks that uh, can inc incorporate one of those, but not both. Uh, right. So as I explained to you, different processes will involve different gluon distributions. And each of these operator definition always comes by pair with one unpolarized gluon TMD and a polarized one. And that is the case even if the beams are unpolarized. We don't need to, uh, to, to go to polarized collisions to be sensitive to gluon polarization. I showed you, we showed that uh, all these various gluon TMDs coincide at large transverse momentum. When you, you are at small x, but you stick to the linear regime, and they start to differ significantly from one another uh, when the momentum that you consider drops below the saturation scale. And uh, as an outlook, uh, we are trying to see if one could use these uh, small x gluons that are not fully linearly polarized to uh, try to find evidence for saturation effects in uh, collider data. I finished, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cesar, really for this very nice uh, overview and talk, and uh, I found really very interesting. Uh, are there uh, questions, comments uh, from the audience? Please raise your hand or chop up. There are various, okay. So the first one I see here is by Søren, so please Søren, go ahead. Yeah, this is just a very, very simple clarification. So for digits in PA, this, uh, I mean, this hard factor is zero, right? Yes, unless the, the, the polarization yes. difference. Unless right? these are heavy no quark option. jets. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Okay, then there's another question by Oleg. Please, Oleg. Uh, hi, Cyril, and thanks for interesting talk. I would like to ask, do you have also the realization of your procedure for Sievers function? So what happens with Sievers function for, for small x? Can you somehow... Uh, I yes, so, uh, so I did not study this at all. Mm -hmm. So I cannot answer to you, but I believe, let me go back to this table. Yes, this was looked at, um, I believe Yuri Kovchigov and his students and postdocs uh -huh. have worked on this recently. Uh -huh. uh, they've definitely worked on the helicity part at small x. And I believe they've also worked on the, on the transverse uh, depolarized nucleons. But you'd have to, yeah, look at the literature. I personally have not worked on this. I think it's interesting because it's oh yes, a, definitely it's naive it's naive to what so it's interesting where is that this uh, um, uh, twist free contribution is is appears in in which of two terms which you you present is there any dependence of saturation scale in this uh, twist three so I think it's it may be interesting yeah absolutely yeah thanks mm -hmm. okay then there's another question by Daniel please. Yeah, hi, uh, very nice talk. Um, I have a question about the forward um, QQ bar uh, process, uh, which is very complicated if you do it in the TMD case, because you get very complicated gauge links and uh, actually also um, uh, factorization breaking uh, effects and so on. So how is that simplifying in your case? Because you have a kind of hybrid factorization or one- Yeah, so in our case, mm -hmm. um, we only have TMDs for the small x guy. Right? Mm -hmm. This is why factorization works because yeah, but you don't explain here. Mm -hmm. Yes, because of this uh, asymmetry between the typical KT that would come from the proton and the typical KT that would come from the nucleus. Mm -hmm. we, we are assuming this ratio between the two KT, essentially lambda QCD over QS is very small. Yeah, so and that's then why it's working. As a result, we do not have any blue, these additional gluons, they're not coming from the top in our case, only from the bottom. Yeah. If so they would they come from both sides, it would not factorize. Uh, I agree. Yeah. 
But, so now but we do have the entire uh, structure of TMDs is included in our, uh, in our calculation. No? Yeah, there is a, there is a, there are three different uh, gauge link structure that are possible for this process. Yes, and we uh, we have all all of that. Okay, so you take that into account. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and there's another question by Farid. So please go ahead. Hi, Cyril. I have a, a specific question about the this plot where you show digits for the ratio between ITMD star and ITMD. Actually, I have two questions. So the first one is, this one is for massive quarks, right? Uh, I don't, no, I don't think so. We have non-zero Q square. Well, I, I don't remember actually. We, it's either photo production of heavy quarks because you need a scale, or oh, it's a DIS right. with a light quark. So yeah, I, if I recall correctly- I have to look in the paper which one we chose for the numerics. Okay. Um, wait, wait, it has to be DIS. Yeah, it is DIS. Yes. Because otherwise the longitudinal photon cross-section would, uh, would not exist. So it yes. is, it has yes. non-zero Q square. It's Therefore, DIS. I don't think it has massive quarks, but uh, it might I have think... massive quarks on top, but it would not make a big difference. I, I wonder if it would somehow, um, it, because I wonder why the longitudinal polarization case is so special and it looks so different from the transversely polarized case. Uh, if, if I have to look at the paper again, but if this turns out to be uh, due to massive quarks, maybe it's worth looking at like light, light quarks and, and see how these uh, results change. Okay, but I, I'm pretty sure it's not due to the massive quarks. Okay. Yeah. It's and, due to the fact that the, non the nonsense hard factor for this process, longitudinally polarized photon, uh, is super, super small. Right, but, but that factor will depend on the mass of the quark. The, the mass of the quarks will enter in that factor as well. Yes, right? yes, but if but it, the mass of the quark, I believe in that factor only enters uh, in combination with Q square. You know, it's always Z one minus Z Q squared plus well, mass of the, the quark square. For the transversely polarized case, I think it's a bit more complicated. It does not come in with that particular combination. Yes, but for the longitudinally polarized case. Oh yes, yes. So I, yeah, so I wonder it. if it will also look uh, quite different for the transversely polarized case. I I wonder if it, you will also see large differences between ITMD star and, and ITMD. Okay, uh, if we play with the mass, yeah, we can yes. easily check this. Yes, yes. yes. And, and one, one more question about this plot uh, I have is, um, so here you say BFKL uh, divided by BFKL plus saturation, but um, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the, uh, here you used um, what you call F, uh, but yes. with saturation. Yes, yes, like, no, this, okay. This, this ratio is a, is a to make things simple, I call it BFKL divided by. Right, so, so probably the difference are even larger. But the difference is in this formula, you're right, is uh, without the second term or the full thing. Right, so uh, my point is that maybe even the difference are even larger than was what these plots suggest because you already have some saturation effects already contained in your numerator. Yes. It could, yeah, absolutely. It could even be larger. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. And there's another question by, by Christoph. Please, uh, thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks, Cyril, for the nice talk. Uh, I have a question about the uh, trijets in ITMD. Uh, uh, what, what are the perspectives for getting a full ITMD uh, and uh, with, with this uh, kind of H, H functions? I mean, uh, could you comment something on that? Um... Well, the formulas are much more complicated. There's much more diagrams. So it's not impossible, but uh, okay. no, it's, it will take some time, but it, it, is, it is feasible, yes. Yeah, and uh, I have also one comment on, on digits, uh, just in, concerning the search of, for saturation and TMD. I mean, uh, we have some results already for this with Sudakov actually. So, uh, and, and I think that that's, uh, ITMD uh, is in, to some extent is, is verified against some of the, of the, of the data for LHC for, for proton LEDs and, 
So I think, uh, yeah, but, but still definitely one has to account for a correct Sudakov to, I mean, yes. for a better Sudakov to more, uh, not, not a model. Yeah. Yes, and actually, since you say that, I might add something which I didn't say, is that uh, not only this ITMD factorization is, is much simpler to evaluate than a full CGC calculation, but in addition, it allows to implement a Sudakov resummation yes. in a much exactly. more straightforward way. Exactly, yes. yes, yes and yes. so that's another advantage that it has. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's no more questions, but I have a question. So <laughs> she's still in the not done zero. I'm sorry for that. So my question is also goes to that plot which is showing right now, because uh, you plot here the difference between BFK and BFK plus saturation. Now what also happens is also when you go up to the collinear case, in the, if you don't look, uh, if you just uh, look at the TMDs in the collinear framework, also in that case, I think what happens is that the linear, linearized polarized blue one is uh, is zero, at least the leading order, as far as I remember. So is this difference which you see in the collinear case, is this in the same, I mean, does it go in the same direction as saturation would go, or is it going in the opposite direction? Do you have any ideas on that? So you mean in the, so, what do you mean by collinear case? Because in collinear case, you don't have any KT. I thought I, thought, I thought remembered that, it, I'm not sure whether I'm, maybe I'm wrong, okay? But I thought that the function H, the function HC, I mean, you have here this difference between uh, HC and FC. Oh, so it's not collinear case, it's more like Birken limit calculation. Type. Yeah, exactly, something like this, yeah. So if you, if you expand your TMD in, in terms of- Yeah, if you have TMDs, you're not collinear, but um, see what yeah. you mean. You can't, I mean, the calculation will expand the TMD distribution. Yeah, so the T in, this, in this case, the formula is identical, except they don't have any KT in the hard factors. Correctly, yeah. But that's as far that's as the only difference that they have. The uh, KT is here is zero. So they will see exactly the same effect. Okay. The other thing is that H minus F in the TMD case will be controlled probably by non perturbative physics. If we are sitting at large X, you know, and then uh, if we are sitting at large X2, which most of the times these guys are, then uh, QS doesn't much, much, make much, much sense. There. It's, it's not much different than lambda QCD. Then uh, the difference between H and F is not something we could have under control. So I, I don't know if one would have to plug in some models that they use for H and for F and to calculate that. Okay. Yeah, it's feasible. I, I don't know what, what the answer would be, but I'm, I'm expecting a similar plot than that. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be interesting to see, you know, what about the difference to uh, the standard collinear um, calculation. Yes. Okay, anyway, thanks a lot. Um, um, then let, maybe let's move, uh, if there's no more questions from anybody else, then uh, let's maybe move uh, to the next talk. Uh, he will talk about the calculation of uh, digit production in BAS at the next reading order in the Calagas condensate approach. So whenever you're ready, please. Uh, yeah, and can, can you hear me well? Uh, yes. So thank you very much for, for the invitation. So it's a pleasure for me to be, to be here. Uh, and, and I really enjoy this workshop. I'm learning a lot, actually. And on my side, I'm going to, to discuss some recent progresses uh, on the computation of next leading order correction digit production in deep inelastic scattering within the colorless condensate uh, effective field theory. So this work is in collaboration with uh, Farid Salazar and uh, Adju Benidopel. All right, so let me start with uh, just a brief introduction. So we are interested in, in digest in DIS. So this is the process that we are looking at. And as well known, this process is a, is a very promising probe for the saturated regime of QCD. It, uh, it will give access to the Weissacker Williams gluon distribution, and it is also sensitive to the protocol correlator of Wilson lines. And we have, we have seen in the last, in the previous talk, the examples for uh, why this process is so appealing uh, for this community. So, yeah, to, I would like now to argue that it's, it's important to go maybe beyond the leading order uh, results because, yeah, uh, I, would, I, yeah. I would say that any reliable QCD prediction requires to account for the next, next leading order correction. 
especially because it enables to to have uh, access to systematic uh, theoretical uncertainties from uh, the NLO corrections. All right, so now let me give you an overview of the of some extant results on uh, NLO digest uh, in the CGC, and especially focusing on the computation of the impact factor. For full inclusive DIS, uh, there, there has been a lot of works uh, in this direction. So it has been computed in light cooling perturbation theory by both Anilan Lati and Patelainen in these papers. Also using the NUPI approach by Baitsky and Kirili, and there are also uh, numerical results available and fits to other data in these papers. So in the exclusive digit case, there is this, the work by uh, Sari, Gabowski, Smirsky, and Wallon. Uh, and the, in this work, the, correlate, the color correlator are uh, treated in momentum space. Uh, and in, in what I'm going to present, everything is in coordinate space for the color correlators. There are also uh, related processes which have been investigated. Uh, so, digest plus photon by uh, Roy and Benito Palan in a framework which is very similar to uh, what I'm going to present now. And since, uh, yeah, on the other that by integrating the reverse of photon, uh, one can recover uh, the results uh, that I'm going to present. There is also the work by uh, Edmond and Yair. And Yair did, uh, gave a very good talk yesterday about uh, this. this, uh, this uh, the digital production in collisions, and also the, uh, the computation of ex exclusive JSI. Uh, and similarly, uh, Yen gave a talk yesterday uh, in, this, in this work. All right, so with this slide, I would like to, to give you the, the goal of this presentation and also emphasize the main results uh, because I probably the rest of the, of the slides may be a bit technical. So. I'm going to present a full NLO computation in the radial limits with complete general kinematics of the digital system. And we have done the computation for both longitudinal and transverse uh, incoming virtual photon. And I would say that the two main results that, we, that I would like to emphasize here are the following. So on the conceptual size, we have proven the constellation of all the divergences which appear uh, at the, in, in our computation. So UV divergences, Rapidity divergences and collinear divergences. And it's, it's a non trivial proof of general factorization uh, for a process with a uh, yeah, non trivial finite state, final state. And on the, on the practical side, we have obtained a numerically tractable expression for the NLO impact factor in a way which is very similar to what has, what has been done for inclusive DIS in the, in the, in the, in the work that I, I, I was referring to in my previous slide. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. So in, in, in my first part, I will uh, present the overview of the formalism and give you the sketch of the calculation. Then in my second part, I will show you how uh, all the UV and IR divergences cancel uh, in, in the, the cross-section level. And finally, I will present some final formula which are relevant for the kind of impact factor uh, yeah, to, to show you that we have <laughs> indeed done the calculation based. All right, so let's start with the formalism. So uh, as you, yeah, I'm sure you everybody know, so we, we work in the dipole picture for uh, deep nested scattering. And the multiple gluon interaction with the target are with some, we have part order of some lines in this shockwave formalism. And so this is encompassed by the this CDC effective vertex, which is basically the, uh, this, uh, the, 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 this Wilson line here for given a transverse coordinates uh, at which the quark here sits uh, in the amplitude. So this is a, the building block uh, of for, for computation. One of, one of the building blocks of the computation. So now let me present the diagrams that you need to compute. So they are real diagrams uh, where the emitted gluon can be emitted either after the shockwave here, or before the shockwave, and thus the gluon interacts with the shockwave. So we have also, of course, the QQ bar uh, interaction uh, diagrams. So they have already been computed by these people here using spinner helicity, te helicity techniques, and we have been able to recover the results uh, using our uh, own techniques here. 
And I would say that the, yeah, the hard part of the computation is to, is to, is to deal with the, uh, virtual diagrams, which can be divided into two classes, self-energy diagrams and vertex corrections. So for the self-energy, uh, there are, again, uh, self-energy, which is attached before the interaction with the shockwave, or a certain energy which crosses the shock wave and thus the virtual gluon interacts with the background field. And if we have this diagram, uh, which actually vanishes in dimensional realization, uh, as I will show, uh, whereas the self energy is attached at the uh, external legs of the timeline graph. We have also a vertex corrections in which the gluon loop uh, again is before, after, or crosses the shock wave. And again, similar diagrams with q 2 bar interchange uh, for these three self energies and this vertex correction in which yeah, the gluon can be attached to the quark and then to the anti quark. All right, so yeah, in, 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 we have used standard covalent perturbation theory and, and not latent perturbation theory. And I would say that the main advantage of this, uh, uh, of this uh, framework is that the setting of the calculation is very easy. It's basically you can uh, follow uh, your standard Feynman rules uh, from any QFT lecture. And as an example, I show you here how you start the computation of the amplitude for this diagram uh, just by writing uh, the relevant Feynman amplitude with the pre propagators here. And the only uh, difference is with uh, like standard PFT uh, is the fact that we have this CGC vertex here, uh, which uh, includes interactions uh, with the background field. So here, here, here. All right, so after, so if you worked out a little bit this, this, uh, this formula, explicitly all the, the, the pre-propagators and CGC vertices, you can organize the amplitude as follows as a convolution between a polar structure, which depends on the Wilson lines, and a perturbative factor in blue. And the computation of this perturbative factor is actually the, the tough part of this computer, the calculation. So again, it, it can be organized uh, in the following way. So we have the numerator, which is uh, basically the direct structure of the diagram, some Fourier uh, phases coming from uh, the Wilson, uh, the Fourier transform in the Wilson lines, and also the propagators here. And right now, I would like to say that by using standard direct algebra, it's possible to organize, again, <laughs> this orange direct, direct structure uh, by making appear some uh, internal propagators in the numerator, which cancel uh, the corresponding propagator in the denominator. And this, this contribution, I exactly uh, the instantaneous contribution with, um, which, are, which appears in the, in the, in the LCPT framework. So by, this, uh, by, working out, by working out explicitly the direct algebra, it's possible to, to have a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, the covariant uh, formalism and the LCPT formalism. All right, so now it's, I'm going to discuss the constellation of the divergency uh, in, in, in our computation. So what kind of divergence do we get? So first of all, we have UV divergence, diagram per diagram. So they appear when an internal momentum goes to infinity, or sometimes sometimes when two transverse coordinates, which, which are uh, which appear inside the Wilson lines, uh, goes to goes to zero. The, the modulus between two transverse coordinates. So we use dimensional realization in the transverse plane to extract the UV pole of each, di in, of each diagram, if any. So we have also rapidity divergences, what we call like slow gluon divergences, divergences when the longitudinal momentum of the gluon goes to zero. There are, of course, standard, uh, say, uh, divergences in QCD, soft and collinear divergences. But one important point is the fact that the soft divergences, which is mathematically the, the which come mathematically from the, the when the, yeah, the momentum of the gluon goes to zero, uh, this divergence is a subset of the slow divergence because, yeah, if, of course, if kg nu goes to zero for all nu, it means that kg minus goes to zero as well. And 
last but not least, we have the, the collinear divergences when the gluon, uh, uh, when the emitted gluon is, is either collinear to the quark or the anti quark uh, in the time history. All right, so let, now let me show how uh, the translate of the UV divergences cancel together. So, first of all, at, at the software of perturbation theory, there is no need for UV renormalization. So, we do not expect any UV divergence left, even if, again, for a given diagram, we may see, we may see uh, a UV pole. So, the, the, such a, so we, we have a UV pole for the uh, squeeze self energy before the shock wave here. We have also a UV pole for the dressed self energy which crosses the shock wave. But, but when you add them together, they cancel exactly. And similarly for the, for the anti quark uh, self energies, either free before the shock wave or dressed crossing the shock wave. We have also uh, a UV pole in the, in the free vertex correction before the shock wave. But in dimensional regularization, when, 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 when this diagram is uh, assumed to be uh, zero exactly, it's very delicate to actually keep track of the UV or higher nature of the, of the pole. So what happened in fact, the, the, this, uh, diagrams here, this diagram here is proportional to two uh, divided by some, by the infrared pole of the diagram minus two divided by the epsilon, the UV pole. So when you, when you set this epsilon IR and epsilon UV to be equal, you get zero. But what, what occurs, in fact, is uh, the cancellation of this UV pole by this UV pole, and what remains is only one infrared pole. And this remaining infrared pole will be cancelled by the real corrections, and I will return to this uh, subject uh, later on. Okay, so uh, yeah, now we, have, we don't have any, we, we still have a pole, but there is no more UV pole, so that's an important point. Now let me discuss the cancellation of rapidity divergences. So those, those divergences are regularized using the longitudinal momentum cutoff lambda minus. And to extract the, the divergence, we, we divide the slope and phase space by using a factorization scale type minus. So we, 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 yeah, we kind of pull out the, the divergences, which now appears as a log of A minus divided by lambda minus. And the coefficient in front of the log, we have been able to prove that it's exactly the action of the Gimbal Hamiltonian on the leading order cross section. So this is a very uh, result, I would say, and very delicate, delicate to, to prove analytically because we, it, it, it requires to, to, to see the constellation between several diagrams and yeah, it's not obvious at all. And the remaining part here is a lambda minus Finite. I mean, it's, it's finite when lambda minus goes to zero. So this equality here enables to to cancel the lambda minus dependence because we can absorb it into the the energy evolution of the linear order cross section up to the scale eight minus. All right. So now let me uh, discuss the remaining divergence that we have that we have that we have. Um, which is the collinear divergence, which, as I said before, appears as an infrared pole now in the free vertex correction before the shock wave. So this is the result for the, the first line is what remains after subtracting the slow beyond limit of our results and after turning the UV pole into an IR pole. But if you add to this contribution, which comes from the virtual uh, amplitude, if you add at the cross section level the integration of the real cross section over uh, the emitted gluon inside the jet cone, so here we, we need to impose, we need to define the cross section in an infrared and collinear safe way to, to be able to extract and to see the cancellation of the, of the collinear divergence. So th this blue factor here basically recombines to part into one jet if they lie inside the same cone of opening on their car. So that's why there is a power dependence here. And if you do this, uh, if you do the, the, the calculation for uh, this diagram and the q bar uh, exchange counterpart, you would see that uh, the, the pole uh, 
the blue pole here exactly cancels the virtual pole. One important point is the fact that you need to exclude the, the phase space with KD minus the, the longitudinal momentum of the gluon here uh, below K, the factorization scale, because again, it has already been accounted for through the GMOT evolution of the hello cross section. So that's why here we have log of K minus, K minus is the longitudinal momentum of the quark, and K minus the longitudinal momentum of the anti quark. We have such logs of k minus divided by k minus. And the sign here, yeah, again, cancels the, the pull from the free vertex correction before the short All right, so now let me discuss some final expressions. So, first of all, I would like to get to give credit to uh, the work here by uh, these people because it was, I mean, we have been able to, to see that these diagrams, where the, the, the three self energies and the free vertex solution before the shock wave, are in our framework in covariant perturbation theory, are actually identical to the one loop corrections to the uh, photon to two bar light convex function. So, again, it's, it, it, it's, it's kind of non trivial because we need to carefully uh, treat uh, uh, the Dirac algebra and make appear the instantaneous diagrams which are included in this, uh, which are computed in these papers. But in the end, when you sum these two, these two diagrams plus the free self energy from the anti quark, we recover exactly uh, yeah, the, the one loop position correction to the photon uh, light convex function. So let me now discuss the, this diagram here, the breast self energy before the shock wave. So as I said, it has a UV divergence, and to carefully extract the divergence, the divergence meaning the pole, the UV pole of this diagram, we have followed the method uh, elaborated in this paper, where basically uh, the, the, the UV divergence, which, which appears at the level of the integration over the zipper coordinate, where zipper is a transverse coordinate of this gluon here uh, when it crosses the the, the shock wave. So you see when when yeah when the, the, the zipper coordinate is very close to the to the quark transverse coordinate, you get uh, UV divergence from this uh, this kernel here. But you can regularize it by subtracting uh, a diagram. I mean a contribution which is very similar uh, to uh, the, the exact uh, dim rate result for the diagram, but with a color structure which is exactly the leading order color structure. So it's only the X, the Y dagger uh, per here. And this uh, factor here enables to uh, smoothly and nicely recover the expected slow beyond limit for this diagram. So this is kind of our final result for this uh, for this diagram. So the first big term here is a finite piece, and the UV piece here is a, uh, is computed in dimensional realization. And you see here the pole, which has been extract extracting using this method. So yeah, uh, I should have said that uh, this is for a longitudinal uh, virtual photon. This procedure works uh, very similarly for uh, a converse photon uh, as well. L let me quickly discuss the, the dress vertex correction. Uh, so this is, again, our final result. So we have uh, an integration over the converse coordinates of the quark, gluon, and anti quark with a color structure which depends on the Wilson lines. And we have here the perturbative factor. And here, I, I, yeah, so this expression is really finite, so there is no need for the complicated uh, regulation in the previous, work, the previous uh, uh, slide. But we see here uh, appearing uh, the, the Dimul kernel. So yeah, to be more concrete, uh, when I discuss uh, the extraction of the slow and divergence, I would like here to, to quickly show you how it has been done. So here, if you set Zg, which is a longitudinal moment infraction of the gluon inside the loop with respect to the uh, longitudinal momentum of the photon, if you set Zg to zero, you have a lot of simplification. So this phase, this phase disappears. Uh, here, it becomes just a factor of one. Um, and this k naught function 
becomes uh, exactly the kind of function that appears in the yeah, in the leading order uh, light one wave function for the photon. And you see that this spin dependent term vanishes as well, and what we are, and we are left with only this kernel times the leading order uh, amplitude. And by doing this kind of manipulation for each diagram, it's possible to diagram by diagram extract the, the slope long limit in the divergences, divergence as zg equals to zero. And yeah, it's so it's kind of amazing that when the, the complicated expression that we started with, we end up with a kind of compact expression in the end. All right, so let me uh, summarize and conclude uh, this presentation. So we, in this talk, so I, I try to convince you that we have uh, uh, a proof of the UV and infrared finiteness of the target cross section within the CDC effective field theory, and in particular, the Montreal proof of uh, the Dimul the factorization of the rapidity divergence uh, for a Montreal final step process. And we have obtained uh, an error impact factor, which is numeric numerically tractable, hopefully, and which will enable us to, to reach uh, this accuracy when combined with extant results for NLO, BK, or Dimul. And some outlook for the future directions that we have to, to pursue with this calculation. So one important thing would be to try with our result to clarify the importance of these stack of type contributions by considering the back-to-back -back limit. And I'm very exci exciting to, <laughs> to see the talk by Claude uh, just after me. Uh, I guess uh, I think we will learn a lot about that. And uh, finally, uh, Again, the idea is to, to provide the numerical uh, uh, results of, uh, and for EIC predictions. And for instance, look at the Intel corrections, uh, the Intel corrections in the back to back limit. That's one uh, possible uh, option. All right, so that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for the very nice talk, Paul. Um, questions, uh, comments uh, by the audience, please. So, so may, maybe I have a, one short question, which will be more uh, experimental. I mean, so the, uh, do you know, I mean, the, how you can test, I mean, this very good uh, and detailed uh, calculation directly with experimental data. And if there are some data that can be available now at the LHC, I mean, where you could be able to, to test, I mean, the, the full formalism and which ones would be ideal, which measurement would be ideal, I mean, to, to, to probe this. With data. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm I'm not fully aware of what is available uh, at the LHC, honestly. Or, or uh, I mean, or even something which is not available, but we we could measure. I, I, I would I mean, say yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, but I think the the, the, the study of the of the asymptotic correlation in the back to back limit. Uh, uh, okay. The effect of the yeah of the impact factor on 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 yeah on the leading order results is something which is. Uh, uh, I mean, that's the most straightforward way to test uh, this, this kind mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah, and for sure, this we can do, for instance, in PA or AA uh, measurement, yeah, which would be good to, to test it, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Right, but yeah, I, don't, I guess in PA, uh, the impact factor would be different, but yeah, the framework, so to say, is, uh, it is uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's feasible as well. We have seen the talk by Yaya yesterday. Yeah, so that's great. I mean, so thank you, thank you. There's now another question or comment by, by Farid, so please. Yes, so uh, just to follow up on, on Christoph's uh, question. So yes, this is DIS, but we could take the, the virtuality to zero and get the photo production limit. And maybe these results uh, can be tested in UPCs. So that's something that we want to pursue uh, eventually. Uh, maybe these NLO computations uh, could improve um, our understanding of uh, digit production in um, UPCs. Yeah, so I think it's a very good idea because definitely we can have also some detailed measurement. I mean, some data are already available, of course, but to, to do some differential, different kind of measurement that could be adapted for this calculation. So this would be very interesting. Yeah, of course, there is a 
quite a bit of work already there, but I mm. think the work is done at leading order with Sudak of resumation. And uh, we expect that as a our, our, uh, subset of our results include this uh, part of the Sudakov. But it yeah, would be interesting yeah. to assess what is, our results will contain things beyond the Sudakov, in particular this impact factor. And uh, maybe they will turn out to be important to describe the data. But of course, this requires numerical work. And, uh, but the first steps are to obtain these uh, analytic expressions with, which actually requires a significant amount of work already. Right, right. And if I can just add something, that's why I think it's important to start with the first bullet point in, in this. I mean, before uh, in this, this kind of numerical study, it's important to clarify the sort of type contributions in, in our result. There's another, another comment or question by Yair, so please, uh, Yair. So, uh, so nice talk, Paul. And uh, I am just curious about uh, the interplay between the real and the virtual contributions that uh, you mentioned at some point in your talk. Uh, can you get back to that? Uh, no, so, so you mentioned that uh, there is a one over epsilon poll and you split this to two parts, the UV and the IR. In right. the, uh, I think it's around slide number 10, something like that. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, can you elaborate a little bit more? I mean, how uh, do you extract or how do you cancel this uh, remaining uh, hole that you mentioned here at the bottom of the slide? Uh, I mean, originally the, the real contributions also involve uh, in slightly different uh, structures in, in terms of the Wilson lines. And then, okay, you have to take some limit uh, in yeah. order to uh, reach the same structure in the virtual contribution so that you can combine them. But uh, I mean, is this, how do you really present your result as a real contribution plus virtual contribution uh, or as something uh, that is already uh, combined? Uh, do you combine this contribution? I just wonder how you really present the your result and how is the interplay between the, the real and the uh, virtual contributions? Right, so thanks for the, for the question. So first of all, yeah, as I tried to argue, in, in our computation, the diagram is identically zero, right? So we don't um, compute it basically. But what, what I try to say is that the, the UV pole which appears for this diagram is, it, is not really a UV pole because this manipulation uh, does not keep track of the UV or infrared nature of the pole. So by, by yeah, if, if you, it's, it's then allowed to combine this uh, apparent UV pole for computation with a, another pole which appears at the level of the real cross section and which will cancel the pole from this diagram. So it's it's a limit of the uh, real contributions. Uh, it's not the general uh, result that you get for for the real contributions. So, so, right? so yeah. So now in the in the uh, sorry in the um, in the real contribution we have this kind of uh, so this is the amplitude. This is the context conjugate amplitude. And when the when when we integrate over the gluon when the gluon is inside the phase space of the, inside the jet phase space, meaning that it is inside the cone around the quark here, we get also in dimensional regularization, a pole and this pole has a factor which is exactly minus the factor in front of the UV pole of the vertex correction. I mean, in front of, yeah, in front of the pole of the vertex correction. So it's, it, I, I, I'm not sure. So in terms of color structure, you can see that uh, these two at the, at the cross-section level, this, this contribution and 
is this contribution time the leading order uh, amplitude have the same color structure? So it's kind yeah. of natural to combine them together. No, I, I agree about uh, if you combine this specific one, uh, but in general, the real contributions also have the case of uh, shockwave involved on, on the grid. Yeah, so, so for, for this contribution, it's part of the, so you should It's part of the finite, yeah. yeah, yeah there is no, it's, so the, since we have already extracted the slogan limit, what is left in the, in the other contribution? Well, the and by, yeah. by the way, what, what about the case of uh, exchanged gluon? Is that also part of this uh, uh, interplay between the real and the virtual, or is this? Yes, yeah, so there is also an interesting interplay. So I didn't discuss in much detail how we end up with this formula, but if you, yeah, if you combine uh, this diagram in which uh, the, 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 the gluon loop is after the shock wave, at cross-section level, so meaning that you have to multiply by the leading order amplitude in the context conjugate. So if you combine this contribution with uh, the cross term, where the gluon uh, yeah, uh, in the, um, is attached to the anti-quark in the context conjugate amplitude, we see a cancellation. We, we, we make appear the, the demo kernel associated with this, uh, with the color factor, with the color structure of uh, this, uh, this contribution, which is the same again between uh, this diagram times hello and the cross term uh, is in the real part. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thanks a lot. And there's another question by Edmund. So please, Edmund. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you see me? I don't know. I don't see myself. Anyway, uh, <laughs> thank you. So Paul was very, very, very impressive talk, and the figure seven is a perfect one. I wanted to to to, to discuss about. I think I understand the answer. I just want to be sure. So uh, because on, on one hand you speak about a specific pattern about the UV cancellations, and on the other hand you speak about recovery in GMOC. And if I look at, uh, on the line of the self energies from the green line on the top line, uh, mm -hmm. these three self energies to precisely contribute. To, um, to all of them, they have a non-trivial uh, uh, sovereignty divergence. They all contribute to GMOC evolution. And individually, each of them already in the GMOC limit, they include UV divergences. But, it, but at the GMOC level, these UV divergences cancel among the three graphs altogether. So not right, just right. The, the first, right? Uh, but you're saying now that you, include the, you, you, you you cancel the UV poles only between the two of them. So how is that consistent with the fact that at GMOC level already, I know that I need the two of them to cancel the UV diversion. Right, so I think it's, it's some artifact of, of using dim, dim reg, uh, because yeah, your point is that this, this diagram here, sorry, uh, on the right, uh, has a non-trivial uh, GMO kernel associated. But in our computation, again, it's, it is identically zero. So in order to, to, and you can see that because again, the integration over one divided by all the x squared in the red is, is exactly zero because we don't have any right. scale involved in this integration. So in order to, to see the constellation that you are uh, uh, referring to, referring to uh, we, need, we need to combine all the, Diagrams in which the gluon does not scatter of the shock wave, meaning this self energy here, this vertex correction here, with uh, the real uh, correction. So this, so uh, it's it's. I mean, there is no preliminary divergence in, in the GMULK as well, uh, as we talked right. about. So, so you want to say that the same the same thing occurs. I mean, this the same constellation occurs also for the phase space below K F minus, mm -hmm. and. So meaning that we don't have, I mean, yeah. Yeah, so you're, you're gonna say that the self energy on the final on the final leg is a tag pole. And this tag pole has both UV and infrared, and if you use dim reg, it's just zero. Yes, yes. I think so. I, I think that's correct, yes. I, I never thought about that. I was treating that separately for the UV sector and for the infrared sector. And for the UV was combining with the two other graphs in, in, in figure on page seven, all that together was UV finite. And for the infrared, I was combining that with a, with a gluon exchange graph to get the dipole kernel, but you can also combine in different cases. Yeah, so my, my point is precisely that both, both point of views are, are correct in the sense that it, 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 it lead, they lead to the same result in the end. Okay, no, no, I, I, I think I agree with that. Thanks.
Yes, just if, if I may uh, also contribute a bit. Please, so, I, sure, sure. Yes, so in that diagram, uh, we first notice it vanishes in momentum space by the reasons that Paul described. But one can also write it in coordinate space and mm -hmm. you would expect that. It's still a tadpole. It's still a tadpole. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And it has the expected, like, Jim Walk kernel that you expect for that diagram, which would be one over because R xz square, but that precisely vanishes uh, because I, of I, I, I understand what you're saying. Yes, sure. I, I agree with that. Yes, it, 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 it's it's a it's a it's a it's a simplification of dam reg. It's not physically very meaningful, but doesn't doesn't matter. Yes, it's just, yes, it's yes, just yes, a, okay. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot for this nice discussion. Mm -hmm. It was good. Um, shall we go on to the next talk? Um, they will be now by by Chutura, Kotko. And uh, he will talk about uh, studying the interplay of the uh, Sudakov and saturation effects in the uh, tie jet production at the um, electron ion collider. So, whenever you're ready, Piotro, please. Okay. You see the slides, I hope. So, yeah. uh, thank you for a chance to uh, talk uh, at this very nice uh, workshop. Um, so, I will try to be quite brief because <laughs> it's getting uh, late. So, um, so so I want to talk about the calculation, which actually started as a, a sort of a little project for an undergraduate student, uh, Elizabeth Ajarov, and then we thought actually that it's quite interesting. So we kind of uh, thought that it might be uh, discussed a little bit more. So uh, so so I want to talk about digits, uh, uh, digit production at the EIC and a study of the, the, the Wysocki gluon distribution. So basically the motivation is uh, the following. So, um, and, and uh, thank you, Cyril, for the you know, great talk. And the, the, so it says it will save me a lot of time. Uh, so, but I, I want to just remind a couple of key points. So first of all, you know, in QCD is so rich that we don't, we, we should stop thinking about just one integrated gluon distribution uh, because you know that we ha we have uh, uh, we have the matrix element of gluon field operators connected by Wilson lines. Here's just one example that a certain discussed, and there were other discussions in that. So basically, we have this very uh, in principle very rich structure of different gluon distributions. And the point is that uh, at, at small x, so I'm discussing the small x basically, okay? And uh, at small uh, transverse momenta, uh, those gluon distribution in principle behave very differently. So they are very different. With large KTE, some of them uh, behave the same, but in principle, they are very different. But uh, one of those uh, gluons, uh, this Weissacker Williams gluon distribution that Cyril introduced and discussed, uh, is kind of special because you can get rid of those uh, Wilson lines and then it has interpretation of just the gluon number density. So it's like the most primitive, I would say, gluon distribution, it seems like, right? But, uh, but the point is now, now that it cannot be probed in the simple processes, for instance, in inclusive deep inelastic scattering. It's not um, accessible, actually, uh, in such processes. So. Uh, we need more uh, complicated color structure to access this gluon distribution. And uh, in our study, we thought that it's interesting to um, look at, you know, what, what one can learn about this gluon distribution um, uh, at, uh, the, from digit production and electron ion collider. Um, but when we look at electron digest correlations, okay, so uh, Farid al uh, already mentioned uh, during his talk that it's sort of not uh, often, uh, this is observable, which is not often discussed uh, in the small X community. So, um, uh, so um, we also thought that might be interesting to look at this type of observable. Okay, so as I don't have to talk much about introduction, but let, just to, um, just to uh, remind, um, so first of all, uh, what is the, how, how to describe uh, production of particles uh, uh, at small x, uh, let, let's say in color glass condensate theory. So now we go back to the leading order. So comparing to the previous talk by Paul, uh, which was impressive work, we just go back to the leading order. And here as a reminder, so uh, if we have uh, first a virtual photon and splits into a color dipole, then this dipole scatters through the color field. And for each of those quarks, 
we sort of uh, um, th there is a, a, a gauge link and Wilson line, and then uh, this is like the basic object uh, which we have here, and then the cross section which is uh, written here basically is described in terms of the the, the, the wave function uh, for for the splitting of this photon to uh, to this uh, quark uh, anti quark pair and um, the Wilson line correlators. Uh, the correlations of Wilson line. So, uh, and then, so we have two types of contributions here. There is the dipole, so called dipole. So it's just it's just the correlator. So, so the average of over various color field um, configurations of those Wilson lines, which are the functionals of those different color configurations. Um, and then uh, this can be then translated as Sir explained to the uh, TMD, so-called dipole TMD gluon distribution, transit momentum gluon distribution, which I will be calling FQG1. Um, but there is, and but but if but there is this other contribution. So there's this uh, average of four Wilson lines, and then this is related to this uh, Isaac and Williams TMD gluon distribution, which in my notation will be called FGG3. Uh, and actually. Uh, in, in order to access this object, we need to look really at digest. So if we integrate over the phase space of this course, we'll not see this. Um, okay, so this was explained by Cyril. So um, uh, how, how we define in quantum field theory um, um, transit momentum dependent gluon distributions. Uh, so we have just a um, matrix element of uh, gluon fields displaced on the light and in the transverse direction, and we need those gauge links. And it turns out that in the, uh, when we uh, uh, in, in, uh, do a resummation of uh, collinear gluons, we get really two types of Wilson links. Um, and maybe what, what I would like to add uh, to what Cyril explained is that um, when we look at all possible structures that we can um, construct from those gauge links, um, there are not too many, I would say. <laughs> well, it depends, right? <laughs> it depends. Uh, but uh, you know, so so these are all uh, different sort of bases, TMD gluon distributions that would contribute to any process, whether this hybrid approach, for instance, um, and and you you can build any TMD gluon distribution as a linear combination of this. And obviously, this linear combination has to be calculated, but it will consist in some of these. And here on this list, we have this Weissach and Williams gluon distribution. This is this one. And again, if we, so we have those two stable like gauge links pointing to plus infinity. And then if we said, uh, uh, we can just choose a gauge to get rid of that. And then this is just a gluon number distribution. And so our focus will be on this guy. And I want to also uh, um, remark that we are, at least at the moment, interested only in the unpolarized. Okay, so um, yeah. Okay, now uh, the framework. So in our calculation, uh, we use this I ITMD uh, uh, star framework that Sir um, was talking about. Um, so um, so basically, in order to use this very simple formula. So you see here is the formula. And um, it, it looks basically like a KT factorization formula, except there is uh, there is this Weissach and Williams TMD gluon distribution, uh, which uh, basically should depend. I mean, we at least in our calculation we uh, include Sudak of summation means gluon distribution. And for the the this hard part, we we keep the the optional gluon, so it has to be calculated with full optionalness, full optional phase space, and also we do include the electron. So actually here just uh, for simplicity, this is written uh, for gamma nucleus, but uh, what we calculate is really the full electron nucleus or, that, or electron proton uh, cross section. Now, a couple of remarks here. So, first of all, in order to use this formula, we should have um, a relatively large hard scale to get rid of the uh, of the, those genuine twists, the, the sort of hard MPI contributions. Um, 
uh, and then uh, we, in this calculation, we want to be sensitive only to the unpolarized gluons in unpolarized targets. So what we do in the calculation, we just we sort of put cuts which will suppress this linearly polarized gluons. It is here, as Cyril explained, um, uh, but, but we try to adjust cuts so that it's suppressed. So that we have this very simple straightforward formula. Okay, so that's our setup. And uh, for the calculation, we use the KT Monte Carlo uh, written by uh, Andreas. Um, so maybe one slide on that. Um, so this is his slide actually uh, sort of uh, advertisement of his program, um, uh, which uh, is available um, uh, and you can calculate various um, processes with optional patterns uh, using this uh, Monte Carlo. Um, okay, so 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 that's the framework. Um, now, uh, the the now, now the main main point is you know in order to calculate something we have to have those gluon distributions and how we did this in our calculation. Um, so uh, our procedure was the following. So first of all, um, uh, so our starting point is a dipole gluon distribution because the, as as uh, as it has been said already a couple of times, this dipole gluon distribution is something which is easily accessible in the inclusive, for instance, deep inelastic scattering process. This is exactly the dipole gluon distribution is the one that is coupled directly there. And, um, and, uh, and such gluon distribution, such, let's say, uh, a model for gluon distribution was, uh, was uh, well, so, um, we only include saturation. So here's the equation, the evolution equation, which uh, which we uh, uh, apply to, to this gluon, this dipole gluon distribution. So the uh, it, it, the same equation actually that Anna showed in the morning. I mean afternoon, my afternoon. Um, this is uh, Kimber sort of Kimber uh, Kicinski Martin Stachta equation uh, with uh, with the nonlinear term. So so the first row is just the BFL. Uh, actually, there is running coupling in this as well, and the kinematic constraint. So it's a little bit more than just standard BFL. And then there are some DGLAB corrections, and then there's this nonlinear term. And um, and this equation has been fitted to HERA data by, by uh, Krzysztof and Sebastian some time ago. Uh, and obviously, the fit was for proton. Now, for the nucleus, for the lead nucleus, which we used in our calculation, uh, we just adjust this R parameter according to this formula. So we just scale this by A to one third and also include some, um, some parameter uh, which uh, sort of, which uh, um, decreases the saturation kind of twice. We sort of, uh, you know, we had many discussions and it seems that it was, uh, using just straightforwardly this formula was too strong. So, but with this D, uh, which in that case would be around square root of two, uh, we found, um, uh, well, we think the phenomenology results are, um, uh, that, that they should be compatible with the data. Let, 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 let's let's put it that way okay so th there is not uh, very strong saturation actually okay so having this dipole gluon distribution then we can calculate the Weissach and Williams gluon distribution using the Gaussian approximation um, so then uh, it turns out that uh, it can be related in this Gaussian uh, approximation which is derivation I mean which is which is uh, approximation within CGC and uh, but we want to include the Sudakov factor which has been calculated for this and many other um, uh, processes uh, in this paper. Um, there were several papers actually. Uh, and so, 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 did, so, so, so this is how we calculate the, uh, numerically the uh, Weissacker Williams in the gluon distribution. Okay, now let's, uh, let's look first uh, at numerical results for this gluon distribution. So here we have this, Weissacker Williams for proton and for lead. Um, so, okay, so, so, so the black line, which you cannot see here because it's, uh, you know, uh, it's covered by some other lines, 
uh, it's the no SUDAC of Wysocki Williams loan distribution. And then if you include the SUDAC of with some hard scale, right? Um, you see clearly the suppression, but then depending on you know how large the scale is, uh, there is there is a region where the Sudakov goes uh, is not there anymore. Um, so we don't want to uh, kind of suppress large KT regions in, in uh, at least in our approach. Um, okay, so, and as a reminder, so, so if we look at the shape of this gluon distribution, just a reminder, it's very different than the dipole gluon distribution. So um, the dipole gluon distribution has this, uh, has, has this maximum, so you can easily, for instance, extract saturation scale. Here's a little bit more tricky. Uh, okay, so now we have the gluon distribution, both for proton and lead uh, for different scales. Now we can just, uh, you know, do the calculation. So the cuts, what, uh, what are the cuts for our calculation? So we, um, we decided to use uh, 90 GV as the energy. Uh, so, you know, for electron lead, this is just a, yeah, the energy for uh, uh, nucleon. Um, then regarding the Q squared. So in order, so what we do, basically we um, set Q squared quite low. So we start with one GV squared squared. But we cut the transverse momenta of the jets at 3 GeV in bright frame. Okay, so um, this is pretty low, but it turns out that if we want to see any saturation, actually, uh, we, we cannot really go much higher, at least within the, the approach that, um, that it's supposed to work only at small x. Uh, so it's pretty small and Really, one should I think uh, one should think uh, about uh, really particles, uh, not really jets uh, in that region. Um, and then we started actually to uh, configurations for the rapidity of those jets. Um, so you can you can think about symmetric cut and isometric. Cut, okay, so um, so these are this cut, those cuts are in the lab frame. And now. Um, so if we look at the symmetric cut first, okay, so this is the, the this left plot, um, it shows the X of the gluon, which by the way, is not the same as, as Bjorken X, okay? It's completely, well, they are related, but it's not the Bjorken X, it's the X of the gluon. So the, actually this is the, the thing that go, enters the um, gluon distribution. So, and, and this is what should be small in order to apply the formalism. Uh, and on the y-axis is just, uh, uh, in that case, uh, difference of, of uh, rapidity could be something else. It, it is not so important. But then you see that if we apply the symmetric cuts, this distribution in x is very, very broad. Um, so we, um, it, it's very broad and we basically go out of the uh, applicability uh, range for, for our model. Uh, now, instead of we do this uh, isometric rapidity cut, uh, we have this very nice focus uh, of uh, sort of, of the phase space, of the events uh, around, um, uh, well, axes which are, uh, as you can see, uh, they are um, of the order of 10 to the minus three, which is not very small still, but we should see something. So th that's our setup for, for this calculation. Uh, okay, here's uh, one more plot, uh, kind of showing the the scan of the phase space. Um, so first, let's look at uh, what happens if we have symmetric cut. So here on on the y-axis, I have gluon x, and on uh, the x-axis, I have the Bjorken x. Okay, um, so so for symmetric cuts, there is no really correlation between the two. Uh, and if we have isometric cuts, then at, but larger PT cut about around four GV, we also kind of go quite high with X, too high for our model to apply. But if we do the, this asymmetric cut, we have this kind of nice correlation between York and X and uh, Lua and X. And I think we can safely apply the, uh, the model in that region. So, so that's the, uh, set up and then um, the observable that we started. So 
As I mentioned, we want to look at the azimuthal angle between uh, the scattered electron and the digit system. So, so it's a total transverse momentum of the jets. And we look at this angle. We call this delta phi J1 plus J2 uh, and E electron. And also, we obviously, we can easily uh, look at the having Monte Carlo. You know, it's very easy to apply the cuts. And also, it's easy to construct different observables and study all of that. So this is great advantage of, of having Monte Carlo. And so, so this observable is just the correlation between jets. So we started both, but uh, our main focus would be on this one. Um, OK, so here are the results for uh, this azimuthal correlation between the, uh, sorry, it's not the jet plane, really. Sorry, this is not the jet plane. This is just the. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so, so here's an insect. I'm sorry for this. Um, OK, so, and, and so, so basically, we, we did calculation in two frames, in the lab frame and in the, the bright frame. And um, um, OK, there are a couple of things uh, that I should discuss on the spot. So first of all, the main result is the red and black. Okay, so let's first look at the lab frame. So, so, uh, so black is is the proton, and lead is is the um, is the, the electron lead um, cross section. So you see a little bit of suppressions uh, up to fifteen percent, um, uh, and th this is full result with the pseudocal summation. If we do not include the pseudocal, we have we have this big difference. Okay, so so you see this difference is really big. Um, and it's much bigger in the saturation effect itself. So the conclusion from here is that we really should, even though the scale is not so big because um, the PT is not like 20 GB or something, but still the effect is very uh, large. Um, um, and uh, so before we did several calculations uh, with the, some a thing which we call Sudakov model. So these are this is the calculation which is here uh, presented with the dash line. So this model is uh, actually a very good model <laughs> because uh, this is just based on it, it's like part of shower, sort of like a, like a deep love based part of shower. Basically, you you, you have uh, you, you take your events and you have them uh, because it's a Monte Carlo, so you can store all of your events and then uh, basing on the transverse momentum of the gluon that enters the transverse momentum dependent gluon distribution, you can basically, um, you can basically um, uh, assign a survival probability based on the big lab kernel. So, so, so this other model is based on that. And, um, but here you can see the difference between this older model and the new one. Uh, well, not the new one, but the, I would say the proper calculation. Okay, so, um, so, uh, and now if we look at just the correlation between jets, okay, without the electron, and again, let's maybe look at, uh, I don't know, in, in this, uh, in this um, uh, for this observable, it's better to look at the bright frame. Um, um, so, so here, I mean, overall, this distribution is very, very steep. And actually, this is something one should be expecting. Uh, it's very steep distribution. And look also that the uh, scale, here is different, okay? It's it's closer to the correlation peak, and then kind of relatively this difference is much smaller. So sort of the conclusion is that it's better to look actually at the electron digest system correlation to see all those effects. And I think, yeah, and that's all basically. So I think I made um, uh, on time and a really quick summary. Uh, summary. So. Um, so what we did in this, um, I would say, quite straightforward study is just we apply this ITMD framework, which means that no genuine twists, but we do include the, uh, the kinematic twist uh, in the calculation through this optional matrix element, which here is the full electron proton or nucleus uh, matrix element. Um, and we calculated the Wysocki Williamson gluon distribution based on the dipole gluon distribution fitted to HERA data with this evolution equation that includes some deep lab corrections uh, and with a two back off. Um, so, um, and the, the point, the main point is that in order to see saturation, uh, we, uh, we, we, we should have small PT 
uh, but the Sudakov uh, is very significant. And obviously the next step is to um, go for full analog competition, which in that case it's, it's much simpler than in full CGC, right? So, um, okay, so that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this, uh, for this very nice overview and uh, studies you presented. Uh, other questions, uh, comments uh, from, the, from the audience? I don't see any yet so far. So, so let me ask um, one, one, from, one from myself. Uh, do, do you see any, I, I don't know, uh, is, is there a natural way to, to distinguish somehow Sudokov effects from saturation effects? Is there a, can, is this uh, possible uh, somehow? You mean natural? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so, well, I mean, it's a so, so for for instance even if we look at those two plots i mean from the you know from the framework point of view uh, you, you can see some differences for instance here if you do the calculation in the lab frame then the saturation is like kind of constant separation and this is just the, this is just the, the property of the white sector williams gluon distribution the way it's calculated and but for the uh, but 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 the Sudakov um, works only in the uh, close to the correlation uh, region. Uh, so so they may have different suppression pattern. But if, if there was data, I don't think you could easily um, distinguish between them. So I think it's a theorist uh, part to build very precise models and test against the data. Okay. Well, maybe there's not. Uh, there's another comment or question by by Farid, so maybe I give him another question. Please, Farid. Yes, Martin. It's related to your question. So, I, I to be honest, I haven't played much with the Sudakov yet, um, but I would expect uh, nuclear dependence. Um, so, the suppression yeah. mm -hmm. in the back-to-back -back case is driven by momentum broadening due, due to the saturation scale. Yes. So, yeah. I would expect that for larger nuclei, you would see. Hopefully, you will see some systematic dependence on A. The, the, the yes, yes, yes. You're right. Absolutely right. Yes. Thanks for this comment. Yeah, I don't know how the Sudakov would mix with this. If the Sudakov will also have some dependence like that. Um, so hopefully, that, 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 that will be a useful tool. I mean, at the EIC, the fact that we can explore different uh, nuclei. Okay. We have to look at, at A dependence and all the X dependence now and see how. Yes. They... Yeah, the, the A dependence, I think, would be the, the, the most powerful because the energies are not too high. So, um, yeah. There's another common question by, by Christoph. So maybe give him, please, Christoph. Thanks, uh, thanks, Farid. Yeah, I, I have just a comment. I mean, to, to what you, uh, I mean, to answer kind of uh, to your question, Martin. Uh, so uh, for uh, PA, uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we saw uh, clearly what is the difference between saturation, purely saturation, and, and just purely Sudakov. So in that case, uh, Sudakov leads to kind of a broadening of the, of the, yeah. of the, of the distribution, while saturation just sup suppresses uh, the, the peak. And I, in these plots, uh, I think, which, which Piotr is showing one quantum clearly. Well, uh, yeah, oh, so, 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 so. Yeah, here not really, but in the other yes, ones. I, I can follow up a little bit on this comment. So, uh, yeah. we did a study for PA, for digit production in PA, and we tried to compare with this, uh, with this um, Atlas data. Uh, but we did, we just studied the shape. So, uh, we decided to do kind of um, the thing because there was not, it wasn't really measurement of the cross section. Um, so, what we did, we just we tried to compare the shapes. So we arbitrarily shifted the shapes and calculated uh, the same shapes uh, from, um, from IT and B uh, and with the Sudakov model. And clearly saw that, you know, you have to sort of include both the saturation. So if, for instance, if you, uh, if you use the linear gluon instead of nonlinear, you would not get this nice description, uh, description of the shapes of the data. And if you would switch off Sudakov, it would be like completely off. Uh, so yeah, so thanks, uh, Christoph, for this comment. This, but 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 uh, but still, uh, 
I'm not sure, you know, this is our point of view on that. You can switch on and off, but if you have data, you can play, for instance, with different nuclei, like Farid said. So. Okay. <clears throat> uh, thanks. Uh, there's a, I don't know, there's a, uh, the, the hand by Farid is, is now still up. I don't yes, know yes actually, I have uh, a question for both uh, Piotr and, and Christoph. Have you tried to look, so here in, in the plot that uh, Piotr just showed, it was proton led, but have you looked at other nuclei um, and see how <sighs> it changes? No, no. Okay. We, we, we haven't looked, but uh, okay, uh, but uh, this, this, this is a very good idea apparently, so. Uh, and and one more question. So, the the proton uh, by Sacrovilliams, I guess it, it's you constrain it with Hera data, right? In in yes. some way. And what about the the one for lead? How do you constrain that, or do you use some kind of model? Um, yeah. So so uh, so um, again, let me come back to this slide. So for lead, we just play with this parameter which uh, the, which is in, in you know one over r squared in front of the nonlinear term so we just scale first of all we scale this parameter by a the number of right you know nuclei and uh, and uh, but but then we have this parameter um, like phenomenological parameter to match some other uh, arguments that are out there that this radius for the nucleus shouldn't be just this in that context okay so mm -hmm. this is how we do this we just um it, it just the strength of the nonlinear term so we don't have more in here actually then it's just the strength of the nonlinear term so the difference here is in the evolution in, in itself it, yes not the yes. initial conditions yes exactly oh i see unlike i guess the standard BK where the evolution is the same, but the initial conditions are yes, different. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, That's okay, and I understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks thank a you. lot for, for this nice discussion. Maybe you should go now to the next talk. It's by, okay, thank you very much. Oh, thanks everybody. Uh, it's by, by, by Chang Yitan, and uh, he will we will kind of switch a bit now to the focus. So the talk will be about the diffraction from uh, ADS CFT to the Palmer order one in, uh, in QCD, which sounds also very interesting. So, so please, whenever you're ready, uh, share. Yes, I'm ready to okay, Thank you. Okay, well, it's getting late. So I will try to make this uh, quick and short. And uh, since most of you, not everybody is working in this area. So I'll try to provide a descriptive discussion uh, of So roughly I have divided into three parts and each one I would just make a few comments. First beginning is about introduction. Of course, it's for this audience, there's really no point making the introduction. Nevertheless, it's nice to point out, we have total cross-section, differential cross-section on one side, another side of a DIS, then we seemingly probing different kinds of physics. Nevertheless, we are talking about QCD. So the idea here is to look for a situation which perhaps we can have a framework be able to both describe non-perturbative aspects of QCD at the same time to uh, incorporate the basic feature which involving a partonic structure of a hadron. So with that understanding, well, let me move on to what's the, uh, what's the framework we would like to talk about. Of course, solving QCD non-perturbatively is very difficult. And in, uh, in particular, try to incorporate the non-perturbative and the perturbative aspect. So what we would like to do is to provide a caricature of QCD in certain ways so makes the problems uh, can be handled quantitatively and also theoretically. This goes by incorporating the idea of a conformal invariance. Now, once we have a up ended this approximation, then we can discuss a lot of things which can change from uh, short scale to large scale. Then we can ask the question whether we can have a more unified description of the physics involved. With that framework, we'll be able to ask the question, how do you go from a weak coupling to strong coupling? 
This is where the holographies are coming in. So let me first quickly just say a few words about how we implement the, the CFT. So the idea here is that, of course, a high energy, if you if everything is move very fast, well, the masses is, if effect drops out. So the theory is effectively a theory which is scale invariant. After all, when you talk about scaling in DIS, it means that certain scale dropped out. Everything depends only on the ratios. The realization of the function which amplitude scattering cross-section depending on fewer variable leads to a larger symmetry. The larger symmetry in this case can be identified with the conformal invariance. So we will have typical theory, which is of course, Lorentz invariance together with translational invariance. But if you add additional symmetry of scale invariance, when you put it all together, you can form a larger group. The group is a conformal group. So we are all familiar with putting Lorentz group with translation to get a Poincare group. In this case, when you put Lorentz transformation Transla uh, translation together with scaling and also an inversion, you get a group which is SO4, 2. So as a matrix group, you act on a six dimensional space. But of course, our real world is four dimension. So in the realization of uh, a, a, a symmetry like this, you either realize it linearly or you realize it uh, 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 linearly, but then you have to take the, your space projected laid down to your four dimension. So those are just a little group theoretical features once you want to implement conformal symmetry. Now, in practice, the theory is easier if you go to Euclidean signature, like doing lattice gauges theory. So symmetry instead, instead of SO4 comma two become SO5 comma one. It is this kind of framework that most of the people in this, this uh, CFT uh, 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 community works on. On the other hand, we would like to st do scattering. So for instance, I have a current, current, go to current, current. You can think about or of current script of pr proton with another current or pro proton. Now we want to do scattering in a Minkowski region, of course. So this requires a little bit more technology than what's typically uh, done in, the, uh, uh, in this particular community of CFT. But nevertheless, can, this can be done. So in recent years, so we have been spending time trying to understand how to realize the symmetry of the of CFT, not in the Euclidean limit, but directly in a Minkowski limit. This involves writing down irreducible representation of non compact group. So this in particular, this SO4 common two involving two abelian subgroup. And it is advent taking advantage of the two abelian subgroup to provide the representation for this group uh, uh, is what we, I will be focusing on. This particular procedure involves what is called Iwasawa decomposition, which provides a unique way to represent the group transformation. Forget about the mathematics. The important thing is this two subgroup is precisely the transformation that we want to talk about. One group it provides a scaling transformation. You want to ask the question, you change the scale, how the theory reacts. Another one is the Lorentz boost. Lorentz boost takes you to high energy. So we would like to ask, explore the symmetry related to the high energy scattering in a conformal uh, invariant theory. So under this kind of uh, 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 framework, we, we will be able to discuss a uh, 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 current current scattering. And in particular, the framework of this side, we, in some sense, can be used to study, uh, 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 more generally, study uh, uh, other applications that of interest to many people. Now, uh, 
just very quickly to provide a representation for a group involving two then compact direction automatically that would lead to a representation involving two melon representation. It is this kind of representation which allow you to connect with ordinary Reggie theory on the one hand and also a, a conventional uh, OPE or op operator product expansion which will identify the conformal dimension of the theory. Now, this is in some sense a purely kinematic statement that we're talking about. You write down the representation for any conformal field theory. If you want to do scattering, this is what you get. The dynamics comes in in looking at what is this coefficient or partial wave amplitude. So specifying the dynamics is for the beginning of the interesting thing. In particular, we would like to make contact with QCD-like theory. It is here, then you relate conformal dimension with spins. So therefore, you can ask a question, suppose you want to use a model like N equals both super young meal, then you can ask the question, what operators will correspond to different spin or different uh, 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 conformal dimension and relate them. The presence of those operator then will show up as poles of this partial wave amplitude. So this is then the spirit in which CFT can be used to study high energy sc uh, scattering. In particular, in a theory, uh, your scale invariant, you can study simultaneously high energy as well as ask a question to change the scale. Okay. Now, having said that, I pointed out that to relate scale dimension with spin automatically led to a what is called a spectral curve. So the structure of a spectral curve then is where the dynamics lies. Now, for those who have, uh, uh, have been exposed to this kind of game, studying the spectral curve is nothing but looking for anomalous, anomalous dimension of the problem. So therefore, once you restrict the theory you are interested in, you can study the anomalous dimension from which then you can get precise prediction for the scattering amplitude. In that sense, this is really not very different from DFKL. DFKL is really studying anomalous dimension of various uh, prominent operators, but perturbatively. Now uh, here we emphasize doing things non-perturbatively, so therefore, and we set up the framework in such a way you can study anomalous dimension of interest, interesting operators in a strong coupling study. Okay, I'll skip some of the detail. So the key point here then is we want to study anomalous dimension or what is called Palmeron and Adderon. In particular, as I've already said, we want to, to get away from weight coupling. So it is here the so-called duality comes in, so the ADS CFT. So not sticking to just CFT, but now I want to for the duality transformation, instead of talking about weak coupling, say CFT, when you go to a young male, I can use a dual description to study this problem. This has been a major advance in the last 10, 15 years in understanding the structure of CFT. That is, you can, instead of studying weak coupling, you can do the strong coupling. In the strong coupling, you enlarge your space to a, a, a from four to five in such a way the symmetry of this original theory becomes a, a, a symmetry of the geometry. So therefore, the system is described by the geometry. In this case, you will have a, a, a G mu nu, which describes the propagation of the system if the space can fluctuate. So the, this is the, the basic uh, space, describes the structure of space. If you have a fluctuation, the, you can have basically gravitational wave. It is here we understand, can understand the fluctuation of the gravitation of the background can be identified with Palmeron. What we have done then is to understand in this geometrical description 
there are other variables. Each one can be used to uh, as a due to some variable in the weight coupling theory. In particular, in this context, we are able to identify what would be the, is the operator which would be responsible for ardor. Now, I don't want to get, uh, get into too much detail, but basically the idea here is that you can start going to, uh, 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 for instance, use the example of an integral to Maria Miller to identify various operator from which uh, ask the question, which one in the Joule theory will be identified and be connected with a uh, uh, metric tensor and et cetera, et cetera. So then once you have done that, you ask the question, can you calculate the anomalous dimension? Calculate the anomalous dimension provides you a dynamics. So in that sense, as I have already said, it's just like BFTL, except the major difference is that using the duality, you can go beyond the perturbative region. For instance, in this curve, BFTL is a curve here which will not allow you to go to, to the right. But strong coupling tells you, takes you precisely to the right. In particular, for the graviton, when you go to this point, the BFKL will not be able to get to. Okay, So it's a dual approach, but in, in practice, but in spirit, it's, it's the same kind of calculation the looking for the dynamics that one wants to, oh boy, the thing's not moving. Okay, good, just very so. So this is, this is a very busy uh, 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 slice, but it tells you a little bit on how in this way you can ca compare the weak coupling, this is BFKL calculation. This correction term basically comes from the study of the anomalous dimension involved in the BFKL study. And this is corresponds strong coupling using the uh, fluctuation in ADX space of the metric tensor to get a projection. From there, once you have obtained the uh, uh, spectral curve, which is reflects an anomalous dimension of the system, you can find the, uh, uh, the intercept. And uh, so here is a graph. You see, I'm uh, plotting it against intercept against coupling. So BFKL is this green line. Start from one, you increase the coupling, it comes up. Then of course, you have higher order, it turned out to be correction, so this brings it down. In strong coupling, in uh, the infinite coupling, the Pomeran becomes a graviton, so has string two. But when you decrease the coupling, it starts coming down. So at precisely around the intermediate coupling, they come seem to cross each other. So there is certain uniformity or commonality of the convergence of this particular two opposite approach. Now, this thing doesn't respond very fast. Oh, here we go. So the idea here then you can already see in this dual approach, the power is identified with a graviton in a strong extreme influence coupling. But once the coupling becomes finite, it starts deviating, moves down from two, which will meet with the weak coupling power calculated from BFKL. In the same spirit, you can ask the question of other round. So there are several uh, uh, potential uh, candidates. We have previously identified two. One begins at one, another one is lower from one. The question really is what happens when you turn down the higher order? And how, whether those features will survive or not? In order to examine the higher order, you have to know the anomalous dimension, dimension to higher, higher order. Just like in the case of uh, BFKL, to calculate higher order, you require a lot of technology. Integrability uh, became part of the uh, 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 tool to study the problem. Same thing happened in strong coupling. In the strong coupling, to calculate the higher order of the anomalous dimension also requires effectively 
in the case of a, 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 a system to Yamia, this can be done by making use of integrability. So Basel and company proposed how to calculate the higher order. We have previously calculated the first one and the higher order now is able to be calculated. So here is the curve. So the palm round sub two, next order, next order, next order. The, the, all the different order depends on how high the order you can go to calculate the alarm of this dimension. Okay, it's nice to see that this can be done. Of course, it's really not very interesting, but nevertheless, you can calculate the several order. This particular work has been done. The leading term we have identified previously and Katikov and Lipitor and company have also identified basically the same structure and the higher order has been done by various different groups. Similarly, for Adoram, this is where the interesting. This first one is one that has been lower from one and you, get a, you can calculate a higher order. So this particular curve Start on from one, now I have calculated from strong coupling that infinite coupling is one. When you decrease the coupling is coming down. We have heard before yesterday that other run weak coupling can also calculate the problem. Then you can see it turned out this curve, join them together in a nice smooth way. Now, the more interesting thing is the question of the second solution which we have previously identified to be at interest of one. Within the scheme that we have identified, we have still that all the higher order vanishes. So there is an other round which stays at one. This is precisely the same feature you find in weak coupling. You, uh, uh, when, when you turn out the coupling, you lower to uh, below one, and then there's one another structure that stays at one. Now we can argue whether this particular identification is correct or not, because it's involving certain technical assumptions, but nevertheless, the strong coupling and weak coupling has certain common feature that when share. Both involves finding tools to calculate anomalous dimension. One's going in strong coupling, another one done in the weak coupling. In this particular example, Adoram and Pomeram join together smoothly. Now the takeaway here, if any, is that indeed, there is such a thing called Pomeram. There is also such a thing for Adoram. You can do it perturbatively or you can do it in a strong non-perturbatively. The question really is, what can we learn from that? Because this is based on a calculation uh, based on conformal field theory. There's no scale involved. It's really not QCD. There's no confinement. Nevertheless, there's sort of an interesting feature that uh, we would like to extract and believe that's the case. But before I move on to, uh, uh, to discuss the question of uh, uh, confinement, let me just point out about the question of coupling. Now, Adoram is a very strange beast. Is a C equal to one? Has a, if it has an intercept exactly at one, that means there is a massless particle sitting there. But we know there's no massless particle. This particle doesn't exist. So what I'm talking about, if this thing doesn't exist, the question really is that in doing this calculation, you have to count, does all the Palmer or other uh, is really a collective mode or the, all the high spin excitation. So therefore the high spin mode exists, but at this particular point, it doesn't ex uh, uh, vanish. It. So put it slightly different way. If you think about rigid behavior, you have a residue over a sign factor then there's a signature factor and times the power. In the case of Pomera, this is an even trajectory, it's a plus, okay? So indeed, 
if there is a pole at, at j equal to uh, a two, you will can have a gravitor. Okay. But luckily, well, we really don't have a j equal to two. It's lower than two. When you go to, if you have a perturbity when j equal to one, this is, this is zero and cancel the zero, you get a finite Hubbard contribution. But in the case of Adara, this is one. If there's a pole here, this must have a zero. So the zero cancels the zero. So there is no physical pole. There's no physical Adaran pole at massless. Nevertheless, as a rigid trajectory, the residue will cancel the pole, get a, you a finite contribution. So the residue of the Adaran must vanish at t equal to zero. The fact it vanishes equal to zero means there's this particular mode doesn't, it's not a physical particle. Nevertheless, all the higher modes are, uh, exist. In a language which for those who are old enough, this is called a nonsense coupling. I was happy to hear this term was mentioned in the uh, several talks earlier. So vanishing of the residue, killing, the pole is called a nonsense coupling. But because of that, the other round does contribute to the total process. Now, because this fact, the coupling to the physical states becomes much more involved. You have to calculate the coupling, you have to call, have a multiple external hadron and put together then you have the ratio of this zero over zero give you the true physical coupling. And uh, it is difficult for me to see at this point, unless there is some higher symmetry involved to see this particular value will take on a particular sign. But maybe there is a, some deep reason for that to happen. Okay, let me very quickly just say a few words about confinement and the global and all that. Now, uh, of course, once you have got, uh, get confinement, you will find you get a lot of global structure. Now this de would depend on what particular confinement scheme you introduce. This is a reflection of a particular uh, confinement due to so-called a Witten model. This is a, a calculation based on the hard wall model then you get a rigid trajectory, which I have already indicated once you have a confinement is coming in. So I will skip this part since time is getting short, but come to uh, just indicate that a lot of phenomenological application of using this particular approach. Now I would like to end with a statement about question of Adoran at L, C, and D. Having established the fact there's no doubt within QCD there is such a thing called Pomeran and also there's such a thing called Adoran. But in this particular case, Pomeran is a, it has intercept above one, Adoran is a setting at one or below one. Question, what's gonna happen when you're building confinement? You have confinement, you have saturations, what will happen? So this is a become an interesting question to ask. Now here, I'm just summarizing of the most of the important talk yesterday to analyze the data for Toten and compare with, uh, ask the question, what can we learn? What have, can we learn about non perturbative physics? Yesterday was pointed out, if you include Toten data with D0 formula, there will be strong evidence that Adoran indeed shows up to the uh, cross section as well as a dip structure. Now, this is very nice. But question then is, is this evidence for maximal Adoran? It will be really interesting indeed if we have a strong evidence for Adoran for several reasons. Because the idea of a maximal Adoran presents a challenge. So I have two theoretic, two concerns. 
What is a theoretical link of phenomenological? Theoretical one is idea of had been proposed. There's actually a sub suppression of other one once you have saturation. We know saturation effect is there because after all, you have a cross side bound. Okay. The question what happened to the other one? Many years ago, we have addressed this question. And uh, this particular point has also been brought up in a recent paper to, uh, two years ago. Point out, in fact, once you have saturation, the effect of other ones actually gets washed up. Now, this is uh, unfortunate. <laughs> of course, the main thing I want to point out is this particular saturation is due to so-called iconization procedure. If you don't use the iconization, this suppression may not be there. Okay, but it's still difficult to see how this can be accomplished. But it's not theoretically impossible. So this actually, if other runs indeed, maximum other run really indeed persists then this offer interesting theoretical challenge to, under, to understand saturation effect beyond the idea of a icon of the icon of maintenance. Second point I would like to point out is that the, to extract the test of a maximum other round, you really have to extrapolate extremely to T near the four or t equal to zero. This is the point which uh, presents a challenge because in most of the fit, you involve some expansion about t. But many years ago, we have pointed out, this, this, this really became some early work of Ansel and Grebov, point out the prion presents a particular difficulty because the singularity of uh, pi pi spectral is really near t equal to zero. So therefore, if you study the amplitude, there could be a very strong, could be an important contribution from the pi pi spectral singularity. So we have examined this particular issue to ask the question, how do you incorporate this pi pi spectral? Now, I don't know whether the detailed analysis that has been reported yesterday can accommodate having a singularity right at near t equal to zero or not. So this again is a question of a test whether we can accept maximum other run as a uh, 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 experimentally ver uh, uh, verified or not requires a much more careful analysis of the singularity around t equal to zero. Okay, let me stop here. Let me just uh, point, uh, uh, end by saying, using ADS, ADS CFT, we have provided a framework. In particular, by staying with uh, conformal invariants, we're able to cover physics of high energy scattering over a large scale. Of course, when you get an extremely large scale, confinement has set in, and there are ways to implement or modify the uh, prediction uh, 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 to build in the confinement effect, yet to preserve as much as we can about this unified approach of being able to study non-perturbative QCD all the way down perturbative uh, uh, regime. And so this particular approach uh, offer many uh, possibility. And uh, so let me just stop right here. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this very nice overview and uh, discussion of all these aspects. Uh, there's already a question here by Dmitry Melikov. So please continue. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chen Yi, for a very nice talk. Uh, so I have a couple of questions. So the first one is about this order and with an intercept of one. So does it really exist? I mean, uh, uh, 
because like, from the point of view of ADS CFT, you see it because you see a massless, uh, a massless uh, field in ADS, right? Yes. But uh, usually this corresponds to a conserved global current. But if we end QCD, there is probably no conserved current that would correspond to such uh, mm -hmm. to such a particle in ADS. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, as uh, 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 Professor Zaka has just have emphasized, and many others will emphasize, we have also emphasized, this mode is absent. That's why the residue vanishes. So you do not actually, if you just, if you don't study the higher spin excitation, you don't see that mode. This is actually not very different because if you look at the string theory, this mode doesn't exist, but its daughter exists. That's really the axiom. But the trajectory is there. It's just when you get to that point, the coupling to that higher state becomes so-called nonsense, so it doesn't exist. But if you talk about string tra the trajectory, the intercept at the one, this state exists. So it is in that context, I try to point out that the C for the one Adderall is indeed in QCD where uh, 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 has nothing wrong with it, except the residue has vanished. So, so, that so do you know what, what, what is the, uh, the highest spin? Oh, we'll start from three, five, and seven. Okay. We, we, in, within the model, we can calculate that, the, the global mass. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so, so maybe my another short question is, is about uh, this interpolation of anomalous dimension for different coupling. Uh, so it, so you, you had a nice curve that really interpolates, but there's a part which is dashed. Is, it, oh. is there a calculation there or is it just, you know? Uh, because I'm different? trying to be friends with the love <laughs> and also uh, Katikov, who's a nice young man. They, they have this part, okay? We have this part. Uh, I just put a dashed line between to connect them. <laughs> so, so, so where exactly the line for the quadrant? Uh, well, you see, you look and... at look, look at the cup. Okay, in in fact, they, they start to answer a little bit, but the, they, they actually need just this is the lowest order. Lowest order means when the lambda is about uh, uh, 0. 0.5 or something. Chungi, do you mind if I say something about the curve as well? Yes, please. The, on the right-hand side, so the, the solid curves versus the dashed curves, <clears throat> we actually kept the, the solid curve ends where we could no longer calculate. So we keep, you know, I, I, what is it, up to lambda the cubed. And so that's as far as we could go with that calculation. And then just the dotted part is just an interpolation. But everywhere where it's solid is actually as far as we could go with the the um, up to that order on both ends, and it's hard. It's a little hard to tell from the plot, but on the bottom curve, you can actually see in the solid part it has already turned over and has started going back up. So we don't know exactly how it's going to continue, but it has started going back up. Okay, that, yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to confirm. Like you see the change in the. In the oh yeah, in the that's all. Oh, that part. I can yes. Ask. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for the. Okay, we have now a couple of more questions. So the first one is by Blodek, so please, Blodek. Hello, I just general comment for Chungi and others. When you show the plot with the total cross sections, they all look very similar, but uh, the plot you're showing does not have uh, uh, rig data from 200 GV. So if you could update it, there is an updated plot that has it, or I can send it to you. I see, okay. My, yeah, my I thought it, it, some of us work hard for this one data point, yes. <laughs> so we'd like to see it. I, you, you, this comes from the, I think, from the Totem papers, but uh, we, we published afterwards and uh, it's there. I see, thanks. For okay, we, we're still friends, don't worry. Okay, <laughs> yes. Very good, I was happy to hear that. 
Um, then there's another question by Christoph. Please, Christoph. Uh, okay, so uh, I want. I have a question about saturation. So what is this saturation within this ADS CFT framework? Yes. Because in 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 kind of BFL physics or BK physics, saturation can be viewed as a kind of branching of a of a of a of a of a pomeron into two pomerons, etc. So mm -hmm. there is kind of a field theory structure. Yes. So, but, but here, uh, if you consider one string, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, what, what's the saturation here? In, indeed, you you are exactly right. Uh, 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 this notion of splitting of a gluon does not have any meaning in our context because here our graviton is is in coherent state of uh, infinite number of uh, uh, gluons. Okay. So the saturation, of course, can be viewed in several way. That is that the uh, uh, unitary start uh, so come in so that this this calculations is still involved in expansion. So the higher order effect will have to come in. Now, we as a practical matter implement that using Iconov. Okay, so therefore the Unitarity is violated. The probability doesn't add up to be correct. So, so, so you you will lead to the classical picture of a black disk. So, therefore, we will uh, uh, implement that way. That's a geometrical way of thinking about it. So, it's in that sense. Let me perhaps this, you brought a good point. When we discuss BIS from this approach, we have a different picture where the saturation comes in. The scale which determines the saturation actually defines it on the confinement scale. In a more perturbative approach, the scale is really set, comes, set, is set differently. So there are area which we would like to explore to find out whether there are differences or similarities. And uh, it is precisely in this context, our current work is to set up the framework how to de describe the CFT in a general context. Then we can ask the question, at which point confinement effect will have to set in, number one, number two, in what context saturation can, uh, becomes a meaningful statement. That would correspond to the dynamics of the system. It's not just described by a simple, a simple, a, a few simple poles, because the saturate, the, the, the simple sum, leading sum from the OPE extension is just not adequate. Now, th this will take us outside of the conventional CFT because we're no longer talking about CFT now, but we're now trying to build it more realistically to the QCD theory. And the, in CFT, there's only pole. Now we, we effectively bring in cuts. So if we want, we, get, we have to ask the question, where will the other one come from? And the maximum other one come from? Where, how the frost other one comes in? To me, maybe it's more important to do a uh, region field theory in this context. Mm -hmm. It is region field theory, I believe, has a chance of capable of yielding the result of maximal other, where the iconal approach will wash it up. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, there's another question by, by Yoshi, so please. Just a, just a quick question about this order on coupling. Yes. So you said a coupling is non-zero, so there is a finite amplitude, right? I didn't say that. You, you said that. <laughs> well, I, thought, I thought the whole point I'm saying. The, yeah, so, so there must be a uh, finite. This is a finite ratio. Zero. The coupling beta will vanish. There will be zero divided by zero, get a finite number. So the, so the amplitude is finite, right? Yes. Um, but there's my, no physical yeah, so my, question, my question is, is this amplitude purely real or is this complex? 
Oh, yes, real. Okay, so it doesn't contribute to the total cross section difference then. Oh, I, 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 I know what you mean. I, yeah, I suppose I, I need a, okay, you, you're right. I, I was not thinking, uh, uh, okay, just for that. In this particular approach, yes, it's real. So indeed, to get a other uh, maximum, this does not contribute, this, this conformal other uh, is not something phenomenologically Realistic, maybe that's what the right word. <laughs> okay. Well, but at least in this setup, it doesn't affect my calculation then. But the yeah, well, but you, your calculation involving not at, at one, is it? No, I, I said the, the order on the J equals to one does not contribute to the total cross section difference. That was my result. And, and you just okay. confirmed that. Okay, yeah, that's right. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, there's another question by, by Dimitri. Yeah, it's a, it's a quick question, I hope. Uh, so uh, this data for anomalous dimension, can you easily convert uh, to uh, Regi trajectories? Is it straightforward? Or? Well, there are two, 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 two things. Anomalous dimension are so defined as purely in the CFT context. So there's no, there's no, there's only spin and dimension. Now, once you build in confinement, I think there's a way of translating one into another, but it's not that direct. Okay. In the cat, I try to present it in the context of uh, anomalous dimension because I want to argue this is very similar to what BFKL does. In BFKL, eventually they're going to put in confinement. You also destroy everything. Not destroy, you have to modify them. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, then I don't see any more questions for the moment. So again, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Tim, for, for this uh, nice uh, nice talk and, and overview. Um, the, the schedule now says discussion, different alteration, but I think it is now became a tradition last days of this uh, workshop. Yes. Probably, uh, so I don't know if, if there are some uh, people who want to ask uh, some question or some comments. It's already late again in uh, in Europe. It's about 7.30. So I don't know if there are some remaining topics or, or not to discuss. I don't see any raised hands. So the last point will be the to, to announce, I mean, and you can mark the dates of the, the meeting next year. So let me check not to say the, something wrong. So the preliminary dates now are June 27 to July 1st, uh, 2022, where we'll have the meeting in person in Trento. Hopefully the situation with COVID will be much better. And then there will be one week meeting about the same topic in, in Trento. So basically the last week of, uh, of June. So this is the, the goal, and of course, I mean, you will all get the mail uh, hopefully in a few months to uh, to confirm it. And I mean, before we finish, I would like, I mean, to thank, of course, all the, the speakers and all the, the organizers for the meeting and all the people who contributed to the discussion. 